take a look at this bottle. The reason why those little tiny droplets of water are there are not because somebody's shaking the bottle, but because the liquid water in the bottle has evaporated due to the temperature, has evaporated into the uh, head space, the, the air space, the gap above the water, but then some of that liquid water has then cooled down on the sides, condensed back into a liquid, and you'll notice I've got the reaction kind of written the same way, but the arrow's going the other way around. That's kind of going to be important a little bit later. I'm just going to write the reaction the same way except I'm going to have the arrow going in both directions so that I could write it as this. Liquid water turns into gas water, gas water turns back into liquid water, and the whole thing just keeps going back and forth. If you were to watch that bottle for long enough, you might see that the droplets change a little bit, um, but they're not really going to change substantially, and that's going to become a little that's going to become important a little bit later as well. But for us, we're going to use that as a starting point to talk about something called chemical equilibrium, which is going to be our next topic, and it's going to uh, require us to change some of the things that we've often thought. So we are going to have to unlearn a couple things. It's not really big things, but way back in the day, you learned the difference between chemical change and physical change was that physical changes were reversible and chemical changes were not. And you were probably given some obvious examples of chemical changes that could not be undone. And there's a problem with those, but um, the other thing that we're going to have to revision or, or rethink or revise, I guess is the word I'm looking for, is that this notion that reactants always produce products and the reaction always goes left to right and never any other exceptions. And I wrote that a previous reaction as a right to left direction simply to say I can have the same processes happening, but I can write it a little bit differently and then I have to understand it differently as well. So, going back to the problems with those previous examples you've had of chemical changes that simply could not be reversed, those were open systems. And an open system is something that is open to the atmosphere, open to uh, new things coming in, other things going out. So if I took the lid off of a container of waters or I had a hole in a container of water like this, yes, some of that water is going to turn into a gas, it's going to turn into a vapor just like it did in the bottle, but the main difference is instead of all of that water being able to go back into the liquid state at some point, some of that water, eventually all of the water, some of that water though is going to escape into the atmosphere. So an open system, mass can escape or new mass can come in, whereas and that means you're not going to get an equilibrium established. You're not going to get those little droplets of water, at least not in the same way, on the sides of the, that bottle. What we need to do, what we are going to be working with, is a closed system, which is kind of the opposite of an open system in that there is no hole in there and no mass can escape, no mass can come in. So any of that water that evaporates into the gas stage, some of that or all of that water is then able to recondense into the liquid stage. It's not going to happen all at once, like not all the water goes to gas and then all the gas goes back to water. It is going to be some of the liquid turning into gas, some of that gas turning back into a liquid. And even some of that liquid that's on the side of the bottle could turn into a gas and some of that gas could turn back into a liquid in the bottom of the bottle. So it's much more, um, I don't want to say complicated, but it's a closed system where no mass is going in, no mass is coming out. And then I can write it in this way where th there is this constant back and forth between the liquid and the gas. And again, not every single liquid molecule of water is going to become a gas, at least not all at the same time, and not every gas molecule is going to go back into a liquid, at least not all at the same time. But equilibrium means that the process of evaporation and the process of condensation match up. Also, with an equilibrium, it is not the case that there's half and half, right? The processes are matched up, but the amounts of in any one state are not matched up. Okay, we're going to talk about dynamic equilibrium, although we're never, not, very, not very often going to use the term dynamic equilibrium because all equilibria, that's the plural, are dynamic. So the definition of an equilibrium is the point at which the forward rate of reaction, reactants making products, is matched by the rate of the reverse direction, the products converting back into reactants. And if that sounds weird, that's because we still haven't unlearned that thing about product reactants always making products. It can go the reverse direction. The reaction will appear to have stopped even though at the molecular level reactants are still turning into products, but products are turning into reactants at the same rate. So you don't see any new gain in products. You don't see any further reduction of reactants. 
It is absolutely not a concentration balance or a mass balance, like I said before, but we're going to have to keep saying that until we get it. Okay, so how do we work with equilibrium? What do we do? What do we express it? Well, we're going to start with a reaction as we have almost always seen it, but now this forward and backward arrow. Now, the other thing is we're going to keep the terminology, so we're still going to talk about reactants and products in the order that it's written. So reactants on the left, products on the right, even though I could start with products over here, and they would turn back into reactants. And I would still call them products and reactants simply because if I've written the reaction in this way, that's the labels I'm going to use. We are going to use a uh, expression where I take the concentrations, square brackets again, the concentrations of the products over top of the concentrations of the reactants. And if I do that, I get this number called an equilibrium constant, K. K, like I said, equilibrium constant, but it comes from uh, taking the, the concentrations of the, the products over the concentrations of the reactants. But once you have a more comprehensive reaction, it's going to look a little bit different. So the concentrations of the, the products over the reactants, where the balancing numbers become exponents. Okay, that's important. You're going to need be you're going to be writing those a lot. Now they can be modified a little bit based on whether or not we have certain concentrations or certain uh, states. But we'll get to that later. So, if I take this reaction, everything is in the gas state. Uh, I won't say that's hugely important right now, but consistency matters. If I have this, then the concentration, sorry, the equilibrium constant, equilibrium expression is going to look like this, where the products are on top, the reactants on the bottom, the balancing coefficients become the exponents. It's too simple. It's all there is to it. That requires equilibrium concentrations. I could get numbers at any point in the reaction and I could pop those into that kind of expression, but it would not be an equilibrium constant because it's not at equilibrium. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. The state could be important. We're most often going to be working with gases or uh, aqueous solutions. We'll talk about solids and liquids and what we do with them differently some other time. Okay. Um, most often our numbers are going to be concentrations. Okay. Can also use pressures instead of concentrations, but we'll worry about that another time. Okay, products over reactants. If we think about this in terms of how that number looks, or the size of that number, the magnitude of K, if I have a number bigger than one, okay, so I've got a really big number on top, a really small number on the bottom, right? That's going to give me in think of 20 over 2. Okay, big number on top, small number on the bottom. Well, the, the number on top is the products. That means the products are favored in that equilibrium. If I had it the other way around, where 2 over 20, well, now the big number is on the bottom. That's the reactants. That means the reactants are favored in that equilibrium and are not producing many products. If it's somewhere around 1, and I'm not going to worry about well, how close to 1 is 1. If it's somewhere around 1, then it means that the system is, oops, that there's a much closer mass balance. Uh, even though it doesn't have to be, in this case it is. All right, let's take a look at some actual numbers and we'll get there eventually. So if I represent this like uh, a molecule of hydrogen as two green circles and a molecule of iodine as two yellow circles, then the products would be two green-yellow things. Okay? And they're separate molecules, of course. If I put a bunch of those in there, so I'm going to start with that many green ones and that many orange ones, yellow I said before, and then I'm going to allow the system to react, I'm going to allow it to come to equilibrium. And at the time I reach equilibrium, let's say these are my numbers, okay, and I'm just making these numbers up. Okay, so each one of those uh, things represents a mole. So now if my whole con uh, container is one liter, then the concentration of hydrogen right now is five moles per liter, the concentration of iodine is five moles per liter, and the concentration of hydrogen iodide is two moles per liter. So let's take those numbers and put them into our equilibrium expression. So products over reactants where the balancing numbers become the uh, exponents, put the numbers in and I get 0.16 as my equilibrium concentrate, uh, constant. Now you might be saying, hey, what about units? And the answer is some of them have units, but the units are not meaningful, so we never worry about the units. Um, in this case, the units would actually all cancel out. Do they always cancel out? Of course not. What about uh, the question of, do I always have the numbers that work so well, like five and five on the bottom and squared on top? No. But for us, we are going to make sure that the math works out well enough so that we can focus on what we're doing rather than fancy math. 
Okay, what if we don't know the system's at equilibrium? Again, I could take numbers at any point. I could have taken those numbers at the beginning where I had six moles and six moles and zero moles. I could put those into the expression. It would not be the equilibrium expression because it's not an equilibrium system. Okay, so I can still do the math, but I can't call it that until I know that it is. So what I can do is I can check those numbers and see if I get the equilibrium constant, right? If I know the equilibrium constant for a thing. And then I would call the reaction quotient. Quotient is a name for the answer to a division. I'm doing a division, thing on top, thing on the bottom. Okay, and it would look exactly the same, but it's not exactly the same because it's not at equilibrium. Okay, if Q comes up the same as what K is supposed to be, well, then the system is in equilibrium, I can relabel that thing as that number is now my equilibrium constant, because it is. If Q is too big, okay, that means the number on top is bigger than the number on, than it should be, the number on the bottom is smaller than it should be. That means I've got too many products, and the reaction is going to shift toward the reactants this way, so that I get more reactants back, fewer products. Okay, and I will say it's going to shift toward the reactants. If Q is too small, smaller than it's supposed to be, smaller than K, that means I haven't produced enough products. The number on top isn't big enough. And if this doesn't really make sense to you, just write out a bunch of fractions and see how you, they compare. Different numbers on top, different numbers on the bottom, and see what it looks like. Okay. okay. That was a whirlwind. Uh, really what it comes down to though is knowing how to, what an equilibrium is, how to write the equilibrium expression, how to do the, uh, the, the, the math of it. Again, we're gonna keep the math most of the time reasonable so that we can just run the math without banging our heads against the wall and then working with the equilibrium. Okay. And then we're also gonna spend quite a bit of time working with Q and seeing what has to happen to the reaction in order for it to get to equilibrium if it's not already at equilibrium. But we'll talk to you again.